Elon Musk just thanked the U.S. Space Force for approving something massive. SpaceX confirmed they received full approval to develop SLC-37 for Starship operations. Not one pad, but two complete towers being built side by side in Florida. Combined with Kennedy's LC-39A and Starbase's two pads, that's five operational Starship launch pads total. No rocket in history has ever had this level of infrastructure. SLC-37 alone will support 76 launches per year for national security missions. But can SpaceX actually handle this scale? For most of 2024, SLC-37 looked abandoned. After SpaceX announced the takeover, crews demolished the old ULA building, cleared the debris, and then... Nothing. The site sat silent for months while everyone focused on Starbase and LC-39A. But that silence wasn't inactivity. It was SpaceX working through something far more complex than concrete and steel. The approval process involved three major agencies. The Department of the Air Force, Space Launch Delta 45, and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Each one had to sign off on environmental reviews, operational plans, and security protocols. SpaceX thanked all three publicly when the approval came through. Why does a rocket company need fish and wildlife approval? Because building launch infrastructure near protected habitats means proving you won't destroy ecosystems in the process. SpaceX had to demonstrate that 152 landing events per year, yes, twice the launch rate since both stages return, wouldn't obliterate local wildlife. But here's where it gets interesting. Unlike LC-39A, which primarily serves NASA missions, SLC-37 falls under military control. The Space Force and Air Force run this site, and SpaceX explicitly stated this pad will focus on national security launches. This is the same market where Falcon has been fighting ULA and Blue Origin for years. National security contracts are different. They are long-term, high-value, and they come with something money can't buy. Trust. If Starship proves reliable for classified payloads, it opens doors Falcon never could. Think about what SpaceX is actually building here. Two complete Starship towers, side by side, at the same location. They've never done this before. At Starbase, they built Pad A, flew missions, learned lessons, then started Pad B. At Kennedy, they're converting an existing Falcon pad. But SLC-37. This is a simultaneous dual tower construction from bare ground. How do you coordinate that scale of work? The construction sequence reveals the complexity. First, crews excavate massive foundation pits for both towers. Steel reinforcement goes in, followed by concrete pores that form the base structure. Once foundations cure, tower segments arrive and stack vertically, piece by piece. Mechazilla arms get attached, the same catching arms that grab falling boosters mid-air. Meanwhile, separate teams dig the flame trench, a deep cavity that channels 33 Raptor engines' fury away from the pad. Steel framework lines the trench, concrete fills it, and eventually the flame bucket sits at the bottom to redirect exhaust. Above ground, the OLM platform takes shape, then the booster quick disconnect frame with its fuel and power connections. After that comes the full OLM and QD systems installation, followed by thousands of cables, valves, sensors, and monitoring equipment. Every system must work perfectly because there's no room for error when you're stacking 400-foot rockets. SpaceX estimates completion by mid-2027, two and a half years to build two complete launch facilities simultaneously. Once operational, the numbers become staggering. SLC-37 will support 76 Starship launches per year. LC-39A adds another 44. Starbase could hit 25 or more. 
that's potentially 145 starship flights annually across five pads. Compare that to Falcon, the world's most launched rocket with three pads, which flew 96 times in 2023 and is approaching 100 missions this year. Starship's infrastructure will make Falcon look conservative, but raw numbers only tell part of the story. Why does SpaceX need this kind of capacity? Because their actual mission requirements demand it. Refueling a single starship in orbit for a moon mission requires 8 to 10 tanker flights. A Mars mission could need 12 to 16 refueling flights per ship. Now multiply that by multiple ships per launch window. Suddenly, you're not launching once a month. You're launching multiple times per week, possibly multiple times per day during critical mission windows. The landing operations multiply everything by two. Every Starship flight means both a booster and a ship returning to Earth. SLC-37's 76 launches translate to 152 landing events. That's three landings every single week, year-round. SpaceX is designing multiple landing zones at the site, and they're planning offshore drone ship recovery as backup capacity. This will be the busiest rocket recovery operation ever attempted. Now the complications start emerging. Rival launch companies are watching these plans with serious concern. Their first worry is simple congestion. Transporting rockets, fuel tankers, support equipment, and personnel for 76 launches per year creates constant traffic. Roads get blocked, schedules get disrupted, and other companies' operations get delayed. Cape Canaveral isn't infinite. When SpaceX dominates the airspace with continuous launches and landings, everyone else waits. Airspace restrictions become another flashpoint. Every Starship launch closes airspace for miles around. Every landing does the same. When you're landing twice as often as you launch, the airspace is restricted constantly. Competitors will pressure the FAA to limit launch windows or cap the annual flight rate. They'll argue safety, but the real concern is market access. Then there's the physical impact. Starship generates 17 million pounds of thrust at liftoff, more than twice the Saturn V. Launching that kind of power 76 times per year creates vibration effects that travel through the ground for miles. Other companies will claim it risks damaging their pads, their rockets, their infrastructure. Whether that's true or exaggerated doesn't matter. It gives them ammunition to demand restrictions. The real threat competitors see is market dominance. A fully reusable rocket launching at this cadence could price everyone else out of business. If SpaceX offers national security launches at half the cost, with ten times the payload capacity, why would the government contract with anyone else? That's an existential threat to every other launch provider. SpaceX can't fight these battles alone. They need the Space Force, NASA, and the Department of Defense defending their operational flexibility. They need the FAA backing rapid launch approvals. Political support becomes as crucial as engineering capability. But external challenges aren't SpaceX's biggest problem. Their internal logistics are even more demanding. To sustain 76 launches per year from Florida, they need a constant supply of starships and super-heavy boosters. Early on, they'll ship vehicles from Starbase. They've done it before, loading ships onto barges for the sea journey. But long term, Florida must become self-sufficient. That means building an entire star factory on the Space Coast. So far, only the mega bay structure has started construction. SpaceX needs multiple factory buildings to match Starbase's production capacity. These facilities take 12 to 18 months to build and another 6 months to optimize production flow. If Florida needs to support Artemis missions starting in 2027 and Mars missions soon after, construction must accelerate now. Every month of delay pushes the timeline back. Fuel supply becomes equally critical. Each Starship flight consumes roughly 4,600 tons of propellant. 
3,600 tons of liquid oxygen and 1,000 tons of liquid methane. Multiply that by 76 launches and you need 348,800 tons of propellant delivered annually to just this one site. That's 955 tons per day, every single day. Where does it come from? How do you store it? How do you keep it at cryogenic temperatures? SpaceX will need dedicated methane production facilities or massive transport networks from existing suppliers. They'll need storage tanks measured in millions of gallons. They'll need backup systems in case supply chains break. One fuel shortage grounds the entire operation, and with missions depending on precise launch windows, especially for orbital refueling sequences, delays cascade into mission failures. These aren't hypothetical problems. They're the actual barriers standing between approval and operation. SpaceX has the green light to build, but building is the easy part. Creating the manufacturing ecosystem, securing fuel supplies, navigating competitor lawsuits, and maintaining government support. That's where success or failure gets decided. The clock is already running, and 2027 is closer than it seems. What happens if they can't solve all of this in time? The answer matters because we're not just watching SpaceX build launch pads. We're watching the construction of humanity's first true interplanetary transportation system. Five operational starship pads, two at Starbase, three in Florida, represent something no civilization has ever built before. The Saturn V had two pads and flew 13 times. The space shuttle had two pads and flew 135 times over 30 years. Starship will have five pads designed for potentially 145 flights per year. SLC-37's approval is the easy victory. The real test comes next. Building star factories in Florida, securing 955 tons of propellant daily, defending launch rights against competitor lawsuits, and doing it all before Artemis missions begin. SpaceX has maybe 30 months to turn approval into capability. That's not much time when you're building two launch towers simultaneously while establishing an entire manufacturing ecosystem. But here's what makes this different from every other space program. When SpaceX succeeds, and their track record suggests they will, these five pads become the gateway, not just to orbit, but to the moon's south pole, to Mars's Vals Marineris, to destinations we haven't named yet. The infrastructure being built right now determines whether humanity becomes multiplanetary or stays home. If you want to follow every step of this transformation, hit that subscribe button for new space review. Drop unbelievable in the comments if you're ready to watch history accelerate, and share this with anyone who needs to understand what's actually being built. The future doesn't wait, and neither should you.